Hello, everyone. It's Mina in front of Learn Languages HD Audio. Welcome to our English learning podcast. So this is a completely new project that is designed to bring English closer to you. Having these shows in audio format is way more comfortable for your busy schedules, and it will make learning English language an interesting process that you can enjoy everywhere you go. So let's get started. Since this is our first episode, we wanted to make it quite conversational.、Um, we also thought that it's very important for you to learn the basics before starting this English learning journey, and that's why we wanted to dedicate our first episodes to the general advice and some helpful tips and tricks that will make this process much more fruitful. Um, all of the advice that I'm going to present worked for some of the students. It was very fruitful、uh, to them, and that's why we are presenting it to you. But have in mind that different things work for different people.、Um, something that I present here doesn't have to be comfortable or exciting or interesting to you, and you may opt for completely different、uh, way of learning. But this is just. Uh, a general idea. Some of the tips for the approach, if you don't know where to begin. So my tip number one would be: don't study it, but study in it. So this is a very general advice, and you can apply it to any language that you're learning. And here is what it means. So here is what this. Uh, interesting phrase actually means. So when I say don't study it, but study in it, I mean put it into practice.、Um, you may have noticed, or you may have not yet, but I intentionally avoid using the word study when it comes to English language or generally languages. Why? Because when we say study, I study thirty minutes. I study. Fifteen minutes every day. That refers to a specific amount of time where we have clear starting and the clear end point. Learning, on the contrary, is a verb that refers to a process. It refers to a gradual improvement. It's something that lasts a period of time. And basically, you can never say I learned the language. Yeah, I mean you can, but you can't learn it completely. It's impossible, I believe. Even our native languages, we still may find some vocabulary unknown, strange, and it's it's very possible that we end up in the situation where we can't understand all of the words, even of our native language. So that's a quite impossible thing to say, and that's why I really prefer saying that we learn the languages. Why? Because it shifts our approach. That's the mindset. When whenever we want to acquire a new skill, it's not about materials. It's not about practice. It's not even about the time we invest in it. But it's more about our motivation and our mindset towards that process. So I say, don't study it, but study in it. Basically, you can put your English skills into practice daily, even though you're not living in a country where people speak English every day, or where your best friends or colleagues know a single word of English language. How? So you can be listening to some podcasts, maybe, or YouTube videos, or you can pick up some light reading, like tweets, blogs. Non-fiction books, and we may get to it later in a, in the episode. But you can try to do something daily that will put your vocabulary and all of the other skills you have into a certain practice. You can turn your computer on English, like you can change the language, you can set it to English, or maybe you can、uh, Google in English. That's something that's very helpful because it really doesn't take any time. And gives you some progress, so you may want to give it a try. My tip number two would be chunk it up. So, what it means here?、Uh, I wanted to demonstrate with this first advice a little bit that 
we actually don't need a lot of time for learning the language, right? Like, we all have 10 minutes a day. 10 minutes. It really sounds insignificant and it is insignificant because like 10 minutes of 24 hours a day we have, it's really not a big deal and we will spend it on something else otherwise. But uh, it definitely brings a lot of progress to you when it adds up over time. If you just set 10 minutes a day and seven days a week, so you have 70 minutes at the end of each week, like it's over an hour of your time dedicated to learning English language a week. And when some time pass, you'll definitely uh, learn a lot only using those 10 minutes. Like that's a very simple math. So I want to tell you that you can start it now. You don't have to wait until you finish exams. You don't have to wait until your kids go to school or when you have that one day a month free. Why? It's very clear because if you do a certain thing consistently every day, no matter how much time you invest in it, you will be able to get a lot from it. Why? Because it creates a habit. You're making a momentum and that momentum leads to a habit. And when you get to a habit, when you get to a point when something you do is a habit, you it's no longer difficult, it's no longer boring, it's no longer a chore that is hanging above your head, um, it's no longer something that you have to get yourself to do. Basically, that get that becomes something that you can't imagine your day without. So learning the language, learning English would be your daily practice, would be something that is as easy and as simple for you as brushing your teeth, like as necessary as that. And as instant as that, you would you won't have to think about it twice before you do it. So that's why it's very good for you to maybe start with something small, but start now and do it uh, on a longer period of time, over a longer period of time, but consistently. So trying not to make huge gaps. Maybe maybe you can't afford every day, but maybe every second day or maybe three times a week would do for you, but just set some goals and try to be consistent with it. Tip number three would be don't translate. Well, this may be easier said than done. Uh, my practice in, uh, in English language education show that a lot of students get really pushed back only because they have that habit of translating in their heads. And let's be clear here, like let's just pause a minute before we say, oh, it's impossible, I, I can't do that. Uh, just pause a second and think about it twice. Let's say your native language is Italian or German and you're trying to learn English. You cannot say a same, like completely the same thing in Italian or German and in English or in Italian and German. Like we don't have same words, 100% same words in all of the languages. You cannot convey same meanings. So that's why it's, if you want to learn a language well and if you want to become fluent, it's very important to give up that habit of translating in your head because of that reason. Translation is a science. It is a completely different field of language education and uh, translators do very, very difficult jobs. So uh, trying to illustrate very, very closely meanings that uh, original author had in their minds and in their, uh, in their saying. So that's one of the reasons why you should stop doing it. And the second one would be, well, you're wasting a lot of time uh, when you're trying to do that. Uh, in written language, it's not that catastrophic because you have plenty of time. And when, when a second person reads what you wrote, they may not notice that. But if you're talking, if you're in a spoken communication, and chances are that you want to learn language because you want to use it in real life situations, 
well, that's going to cause you some trouble. You will have some uncomfortable pauses and that's going to shrink your confidence, which you definitely don't want to happen. So try to cut it out and how you can do it. Well, just be minimalistic. Use the words you already know and don't look for anything else. Try doing that. I promise you, if you just try doing that for maybe five days, afterwards, you will never have need for it. There is another reason why is that important. When you start small, when you start from creating sentences only from words that you know, after some time, you will be able to learn much more rapidly. Uh, because when you do that, you're, you're pushing yourself. You're using and you're kind of building on what you already know. And you will be able to bring back vocabulary that you, that you're acquiring, uh, much faster. So that's a very important thing to, to do. My next tip would be a little bit more concrete. So, um, one of my really close friends, uh, once gave me advice. And at that point, she was already fluent in six languages. And she told me that her number one tool for learning a new language or generally practicing her language skills, no matter how advanced or uh, not advanced she is, uh, was interview. She uses interviews of people who speak the language she targeted um, as native language, as their native language. And that is really amazing. It was a game changer for me for a number of reasons. Firstly, you're building your sentence structures, you're building your slang vocabulary, you're putting grammar into practice, and you're listening to some uh, very interesting collocations. It's very rich to you can enrich your vocabulary and generally your skills. You're sharpening your listening skills and also your speaking skills after some time because you'll be able to reproduce that. You're maybe strengthening your accent. It gives you a lot of benefits. But on the other hand, you're getting knowledgeable in a variety of subjects. So if you're picking a person from the field that you're interested in, let's say you like sports and then you take some NBA player and you watch their you watch their interviews after games or maybe you're more into movies so you're watching the interviews of famous producers or actors that are native english speakers well you're also going to learn a lot about industry you're going to learn a lot about the subjects that they are talking about and that they are experts in. And that's another reason why I definitely believe you should give it a try. Next, I have some other resources that are going to make learning English a fun process, but also very beneficial. Watch movies. Watch movies and I really advise and cannot recommend it enough. Do it with subtitles in English. That's, that's the key word in English. So why do I say that? A lot of research, uh, showed that when we integrate a couple of senses at the same time, we are going to learn more. That learning session is going to yield much more of a product than it would do if you were using just like one of your senses. So for example, you are reading a book and I'll get to that later. It's very important. But let's say you're reading a book passively. Um, and on the other hand, you have watching a movie with a subtitle. When you're watching a movie, your listening skills are active. When you're watching a movie with subtitle on English subtitle, at the same time, you're listening and you're also reading. You're seeing that. And instantly, you have higher chances of learning more of the vocabulary than you would if you were just passively turning the pages. Then I said books. Uh, that's another thing that I can't recommend enough. Uh, you're, you're also building your uh, reading skills that are necessary for your day-to-day -day life, for your work, for your education, no matter what you're into, uh, or for your general literacy, 
your concentration. It's, it's great for a number of reasons. But when it comes just to language perspective, um, I believe that reading is something that you can do for fun, that you can do for gaining knowledge, and that you can do for gaining a lot of vocabulary. Aside from vocabulary, there are always sentence structures, grammar structures that are easiest to see in a book. And when something sounds interesting, you can come back to it later, etc. Here we uh, come back to the translation. A lot of people would say, well, I can't read uh, because there, that there would be a lot of words that I don't know. That's true. It will happen and it will always be happening. Maybe later it would not be that obvious. Maybe that number of unknown words would shrink, but it would still be happening. And of course, it happens in our native languages too sometimes. So what is an advice here? Generally, we say to students, don't translate all of it because you're losing the points, you're, you're losing your thoughts, you can't follow the story that clearly. And when you just translate in the dictionary, maybe that meaning would not match exactly with what you already have in a book. So the key number would be, the magic number would be checking in dictionary, maybe one third of the unknown words in, in a certain book or on a page. Check one third of those and for the rest, try to conclude from the context. Even though you may not have a clear idea what that word means, you will still be able to understand it. You will still be able to get a point and you will be able to use that word later. And when you hear it, you will know what it means. So that's a trick and please stick to it. Try it. Give it a try and you'll see I'm right. Then uh, there are a lot of other tools that some of those we have mentioned already, but I believe that I should repeat it all together. So I mentioned YouTube, I mentioned your favorite podcasts, then we also have books. In that category, I also count like magazines, blogs, tweets, light reading, like comments or something. All of that would do a trick. And when you're choosing these materials, choose something that's interesting to you. So if you're generally into science fiction and you don't like romantic movies at all, don't watch romantic movie, watch a science fiction movie and put on an English subtitle. It's very important that you focus on words that you're going to use. You're learning the language that you will use, not that you will know. And if you don't use it, you will forget it. So when you, something is interesting to you, it will be easier to follow. And secondly, you will be using those words so it would stick to you for a longer period of time. You will be able to build on that base uh, much more of the vocabulary. Uh, another tip I have would be to search online for other interesting resources. There are websites such as EDX. There are various apps for learning languages. Everyone knows about Duolingo or maybe Drops. These are not the best choices for learning specifically English maybe, but you will find when you just open your Play Store, you'll be able to find a lot of other applications that will make learning a fun process to you. EDX is a website that offers free university or courses from other certified institutions, and you can find it in other languages. So you can get use of those materials and build your English skills and your other skills at the same time. This may sound as a lot, but let's summarize it quickly. So the key points, the key takeaways here would be to just start. Start with small goals. Start no matter how much time you have to spare on learning English language at a moment. And over a certain period, you will have a great cumulative effect and you will be amazed at how much you have achieved without even noticing. After some time, it will all become habitual to you. It will become very interesting and necessary. And I promise that you will enjoy it. So thank you for listening to this podcast. Thank you for joining me. Once again, it's Mina in front of Learn Languages HD Audio. 
Stay tuned for other episodes next week. We are bringing you something very interesting. So make sure to follow up uh, if you have any questions or you want to give us some uh, advice or some ideas for new episodes, make sure to leave comments below. Thank you once again. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Hello everyone, it's Mina in front of Learn Languages HD Audio. Welcome to our English learning podcast. So this is a completely new project that is designed to bring English closer to you. Having these shows in audio format is way more comfortable for your busy schedules and it will make learning English language an interesting process that you can enjoy everywhere you go. Present simple tense. We use it when we talk about our habits, when we talk about certain actions that we perform daily or regularly. Let's say every morning I wake up at 6 a.m. and at 7 a.m. I drive my car to work. So that's your habit. You repeat that same routine every day, but it doesn't have to be every day. It can be like every year we go to a museum. Still, it doesn't have to be that regular, but we want something that repeats over time. We want certain action that doesn't happen just now and it's finished now and we don't talk about it anymore. It's something that happens and repeats itself over time. Another usage of this tense would be for facts. So, something that is general truth, something that is always true and that is a fact. So we can say, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. That's a statement that's always true, it's always correct, and that's why you use present simple tense with it. We can also use it with permanent situations. For example, you can say, I live in Germany. That means that over a longer period of time, you live in Germany. That's your place of living, that's your location, and that's why uh, you want to use this present simple tense that refers to something that is that is very general, that is very stable, and that happens over a longer period of time. Also, there is another usage of present simple tense that we are going to mention, although I have already said that we don't use present simple tense uh, when we talk about actions that happen at the moment when we are talking about them, and that we have started now and that we are going to finish maybe in a couple of minutes, uh, but there is an exception to your rule. So let's imagine you're watching a show, you're watching a match, football match, and then you have that person that is commenting it, saying like, he has the ball and he scores a goal. So he sees that in that moment. And of course, grammatically, that's correct. That's a correct usage because it's not necessary to use those progressive tenses that we are going to mention later because that's a short action and it lasts a short period of time. So that's why it's not necessary to use uh, the progressive tense that we are going to mention later. How do we form this present simple tense? So when we want to make a positive sentence, we use subject on a first place, an English language subject often comes at a first place. Uh, you have subject and then you have verb in its uh, basic form, in its infinitive form. Uh, also, it can be, uh, we can also have another form in the present simple uh, and that's for the third person singular. So when we have he, she or it, we can say she walks to school or she drives to school every day because we add that S to a third person singular form of a verb. How do we form this present simple tense? So when we want to make a positive sentence, we use subject on a first place, an English language subject often comes at a first place. Um, you have subject and then you have verb in its basic form, in its infinitive form. 
we can also have another form in the present simple, and that's for the third person singular. So when we have he, she, or it, we can say she walks to school or she drives to school every day because we add that s to a third person singular form of a verb. When we want to make a negative, we use a helping auxiliary verb do, and we make it negative. So we say, I don't drive to school every day. But you can also say, she doesn't drive to school every day. So we have do and does as the forms of verb to do. But does comes to a third person singular. There is one thing to notice that we say, uh, he drives to school every day. But we also say, he doesn't drive to school every day. Most of the tenses are going to make their interrogative forms just by inversion. That means that a subject and that auxiliary verb are going to switch the positions. So the subject is no longer on a first position, it's uh, going to come to a second one, and do or does in this case are going to come to the front. So it's going to be, uh, does she go to school every day? Does he drive to school every day? Do you wash your car? regularly. There is another thing that can be helpful to you when you're maybe tested in school on tenses. It's the fact that there are certain adverbs of time that are going to serve the purpose of a sign mark, like a sign on a road. When you say those, it's more likely that you're going to use present simple, for example. So we have for present simple, those adverbs of time are often, always, usually, sometimes, like those adverbs of frequency. And they, if you just think about the meaning of those words, you're going to see that they imply a certain habitual repetition. So that's all for the present simple tense. Thanks for being with us, hopefully you enjoyed it, and we really do look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye! Hello everyone, welcome to the Learn Languages HD Audio Podcast. So we love to have you with us. Make sure to learn something new today and expand your horizons for a little bit. This week, we present you with our Merry Christmas special. Holidays are coming up soon, and although this year got extremely complicated with coronavirus pandemic, our happy season will look slightly different from what we are used to and what we hoped for, but let's make sure you make it special to you. You could spend it modestly with your dearest ones and you could also keep yourself safe and healthy in the same time. So this week we are bringing you everything about Christmas that you should know, including the history of Christmas and how it is celebrated around the world. We will also mention some interesting stories and facts, so I really hope you will enjoy it. Whether you are listening to this episode because you want to learn holiday vocabulary or the story behind Christmas, or you maybe just want to supplement the holiday spirit by sitting with your family around a 21st century radio, I am sure that you would love this show. And we have also promised, if you remember in our very first episode, that this show will bring versatility fun, education, and utility all together. So let's get started. Although we love this holiday for a variety of reasons, we are often caught clueless about what this means and where it comes from. So it is not a rare case that even if we celebrate it, even if we are religious or non-religious, or if we go to church or 
Regardless of all those facts, it is not a rare case that people don't actually know what is there behind Christmas and that's nothing bad, nothing to be ashamed of. And that's why I believe that we here you're going to learn some useful information. As you know, or you may not know, Christmas is an annual holiday in Christianity that celebrates the birth of Jesus. And the English word that we use, Christmas, actually stands for Mass for Christ or Christmas. So, Christ Mass, Christmas. This Mass service is very important to Christians because it speaks that Jesus died for people and that he came back to life. And this service is the only one taking place after sunset. So that's why people started having it at midnight. And that's another reason for its importance. It's great importance for Christian people. There are many other terms for this holiday that preceded the word Christmas and are most probably of German or Anglo-Saxon origin, standing for the feast, which is a large meal. So feast is a large meal, specifically prepared for some sort of a celebration. So we say Christmas in Germanic or Anglo-Saxon origin stands for the feast for winter solstice. And what is actually solstice? It is a moment that happens twice a year, when sun is at its farthest from the south or the farthest from the north. Terms in other languages, for example, in Italian we have Natale or Navidad in Spanish, both refer to nativity, while the German word for Christmas translates into hollowed night, and that's a very common um, phrase that you can hear in Christmas song and Christmas stories, Christmas movie, like Holy Night or Hollowed Night. And there is one question that people often ask. Why do we celebrate Christmas on the 25th of December? Yet, why we celebrate on this exact day is yet unclear. However, there are some theories or hypothetical explanations regarding it. Since the New Testament does not identify a precise date of Jesus' birth, we believe that a date was set by Sextus Julius Africanus, who was the first Christian historian, and it's believed that this date was set in 221st, and it became widely accepted later. So that's one of the theories. Another explanation connects the choice of the 25th as the date of Jesus' birth to the Roman holiday that celebrated winter solstice with symbolic of winter rejection and rebirth of spring. Another point of view implies that the 25th dates back to the 21st of March. So 25th of December was not by a random choice. It has its origin in the 21st of March, which is the day of the world's creation. And it is actually afterwards, four days after 21st, uh, when the light was created. And it's believed to be the day of Jesus' conception. So that's the day when he was created, let's say, when his mother became pregnant. That's what word conception means in very free language. Nine months later, so nine months from 25th of March, we have the 25th of December. And according to this theory, that's when Jesus was born. Christmas had also been celebrated on January 6th, when members of early church also celebrated the Epiphany. So what is Epiphany? That's the term that stands for the revelation that Jesus was God's son. And it also represents the baptism of Jesus, the date of his baptism. Jesus' baptism was originally seen as much more important than his birth, as that was when he actually started his mission. That's why 
many believed that the date of his baptism was more important to celebrate than his actual birthday. The Jewish festival of lights, Hanukkah, starts on the eve of the 25th in one month according to Jewish calendar. So the, that month is approximately the same time as December for us. And Hanukkah celebrates when the Jewish people were able to rededicate and worship in their temple in Jerusalem after for many years they were not allowed to practice their religion. Jesus was a Jew, as you may or may not know, so this could be another reason that helped decide on 25th of December as the date for Christmas or the date of Jesus' birth. There are a couple of other terms that we should explain before we continue with our story, let's say. Most of the world uses the Gregorian calendar, which was implemented by Pope Gregory XIII in 1582. Before that, the Julian calendar was used, and it was named after Julius Caesar. The Gregorian calendar was believed to be more accurate than the Roman calendar, since Roman calendar had too many days, according to some. Here we can make some time in the lesson for an interesting explanation regarding English language. I said that Pope Gregory XIII established this calendar, Gregorian calendar, in 1582. So I wanted just to take some time to explain how we actually read years in English language. So you may know it or may not, but when we have a year, it's it consists, the death number consists of four digits. And how do we read it? We read it two by two. So we take first two digits and read it as a separate number. And then we read second two digits as a separate number. So 1582, so digits one, five, eight, and two, we would read 1582. So group them in parts of two, two digits, and read those together. Okay, so now it's time to go back to our story. And many Orthodox churches still use this Julian calendar and celebrate Christmas on the 7th of January. So many people around the world actually find this fact surprising. Some people that only know the Western tradition regarding Christmas usually take some time to process the fact that somewhere around the world people celebrate Christmas on a different date. And that's possible. There are some other variations too, but the main two, let's say, main two dates would be according Julian calendar and according Gregorian calendar. As I said, in Julian calendar, people celebrate Christmas on 7th of January. And that is actually 25th of December. That's where the 25th of December would be on the Julian calendar. So those two calendars differ by 11 days, if I'm not mistaken. That's why we have that difference, but they represent the same thing. So they have the same story. They share the same story behind the Christmas, but the date is just a little bit different. Armenian Apostolic Church celebrates Christmas on the 6th of January. So we have 6th, 7th, and also 25th of December. And in some parts of the UK, believe it or not, although they celebrate Christmas as most of the world does, um, they still celebrate Old Christmas in some parts of UK on January 6th. So what if I told you that Christmas wasn't always as big as it is now? So it wasn't always as important and as big holiday as we know it today. For a very long time, Good Friday and Easter were celebrated as major Christian holidays. Roman Catholic churches celebrated the first Christmas Mass at midnight, and Protestant churches have started to increasingly hold Christmas candlelight services on the evening of December 24th, and that's how Christmas has actually evolved. 
in the first centuries of Christianity, actually the church was opposing this holiday. Yeah, it's a Christian holiday. It's also became one of the major holidays, but still popes and church in general were opposing it. Why? Because according to the church perspective, a celebration of a birthday, especially when it comes to saints and martyrs, is a pagan custom that was not in accordance with the church. So on the contrary, the church's opinion was that these should be honored. When I say these, I mean saints and martyrs. These should be honored on the days of their martyrdom. So that's in the simple language again, that's when they became important, the church. Here we have another interesting question that you may have thought about before. So why do we celebrate Christmas Eve? Yes, we already explained why we celebrate Christmas, but why is there Christmas Eve? Probably this tradition comes from ancient Jewish reckoning for Jews in the past. A day began at 6 in the morning and lasted until 6 in the evening the same day. So that's how they got to celebrate Christmas Eve. But another question is, okay, so we have now Christmas Eve and Christmas, but why do we celebrate 26th of December as well? In the past, it was believed that all Christian holidays should last sacred seven days, but it was reduced to a single day after some time, like to a single day after Christmas. Maybe that's because of industrialism, marketing, I don't know, business world, whatever. But with the time, it was decreased to a single, single day after Christmas. Bible in general and Christianity, but especially Bible as a literature piece, is all rich and full in symbols. Christmas says other Christian holidays actually takes a lot uh, from that from that culture and from that trend. Now we are going to discuss some symbols that you may have never questioned, but it's good to know and it's good to teach someone and share what you know with others. So why do we use evergreen trees for our Christmas trees? And you, as you will see later, not everyone does that, but a generally in our general culture, evergreen trees symbolize eternal life. So evergreen, they don't lose their their leaves. They maybe change color, but they really stand for the life. And these were introduced by Martin Luther to the Reformation Church as a picture of our endless life in Christ by bringing in a tree to the family on Christmas Eve and the tree should be lit with candles. And candles also have the symbol of its own. They represent the Jesus and the Jesus as a light of the world. We already mentioned hallowed night when we were discussing the origin of the word Christmas, but holy tells the story of the thorns in Jesus' crown. And another interesting symbol is that most of the people decorate their trees red and we have red ribs on all other Christmas decorations. Why is that? Red is a color of Christmas in a way that speaks of Christ's blood and death. So this one was maybe a little bit more obvious, but still it's not random. It's not a random choice. Everything regarding Christmas has its own backstory and its own meaning. So when December comes, or better say January comes, a lot of people feel broke. Yeah, a lot of us feel broke. And why do we feel broke? Because we spend a lot of money on Christmas presents. You may ask yourself at that time, why do we gift on Christmas? Well, gifts stand for the gifts to baby Jesus. And each of the gifts speak and represent of a part of his incarnation, like majesty in life, bitterest agony in death, and he is God's perfect gift to us people. Bells are associated with ringing out news, calling for attention, 
And moreover, these represent, like the bell sound for Christmas represents good news, as Jesus brought only good to people. And all of that speaks of warmth, speaks of joy and security. Of And that's actually what Christmas means to most of the people worldwide. It means warmth of the family. It means joy. It means pleasure. It means peace. Christmas would not be Christmas without a famous guy, Santa Claus. And Santa Claus is actually a product of Dutch actually saying Santa Claus, and in English we translated that to Saint Nicholas. He became aware of some desperate needs of his congregation and a family having to sell their children into slavery. So one night, as the legend says, one night he came and left money on their doorstep, and it was the gold in stocking. So that's how St. Nicholas became Santa Claus and how a bishop from church became St. Nicholas and how it all went on. But there is another story behind stocking tradition. It says that a man had three daughters and he was poor, so girls didn't have a dowry. Dowry is, let's explain the word dowry, represents some things that you buy and that, that a girl buys, her family buys it for her, and she is supposed to bring that into her marriage. And girls at that time couldn't get married without a dowry. So Saint Nicholas saw that and dropped three golden coins into stockings that were randomly drying upon a fireplace. It's December, come on, it has to be, it has to be all wet so the girls could get married afterwards. And that's another story behind the stocking tradition. So from the early days of power, um, yeah, from the early days, like let's say kindergarten, primary school nowadays, we know for Christmas cards. And it all started back in 1844. So here again, we read two by two, 1844. An English artist, and his name was William Dobson, he drew some pictures in England, his hometown, for that season, like for holiday season and generally for winter season. And these have gone extremely popular and found their way across Atlantic, so these reached United States, where in 1846, coal and horsley, so the great commercial potential behind this tradition, and started the production of something that is now over $1 billion worth industry. Some data shows that over $4 billion of Christmas cards are sent each year only in America, not to mention the rest of the world. So it really turned out to be a great, great industry and great potential, commercial potential. As Christianity was spreading as a religion, Christmas became part of other traditions. So in many of these countries, Christians don't make even a majority of the population in many of these countries where uh, Christmas spread. And there are certain countries that count very, very few Christians actually, but they celebrate Christmas as a cultural holiday. Christmas customs in these societies often resemble Western traditions because they preserve Christianity as a cultural product or a component or Western world, if you want to take it that way. A good example of such a country uh, would be Japan. When it comes to religion, Japanese people are dominantly Shinto or Buddhist, while they wildly celebrate Christmas with traditional Christmas trees and lights, Christmas songs or some of them just as a day free of work, but they really celebrate this holiday, although very, very, very few people in Japan uh, are actually Christians and celebrate Christmas as a religious holiday. In Mexico, on the other hand, on days that precede Christmas, the search, there is a something that looks like a party, looks like a game, the search of Mary and Joseph, for the place to stay 
And the children try to break a piñata that is filled with toys and candy. So it turns out to be a fun holiday for, for children. Christmas is also a summer festival in Brazil. And people celebrate it with picnics, fireworks, other festive activities, as well as church celebrates midnight mass. So this way it looks like, um, it looks like a 4th of July. Uh, with fireworks and everything. In some parts of India, this evergreen tree as we know it, evergreen Christmas tree is replaced with mango tree or the bamboo tree or even a banana tree. And the houses are decorated with mango leaves and paper stars. So it definitely looks quite different from what we are used to and what is stereotype of Christmas decoration. And in India, it remains a Christian holiday, largely, and they don't give it any special any special meaning, but they do decorate and kind of symbolize it in a way. In Slavic Balkan countries, let's say, Christmas Eve morning is very traditional, and that's the, that's the day when men go to woods and cut a yule log but in these countries yule log is actually oak tree and uh, more people live in the towns nowadays so people can't actually go to the woods it's not that convenient as it was in the past so they can now just buy that special kind of tree that has a special name here called uh, badnyak in these countries slavic countries and balkan countries if they celebrate christmas that kind of Christianity belongs to, it follows uh, Julian calendars. So people there spend their Christmas and celebrate their Christmas on 7th of January. So on the Christmas Eve morning, men go to the woods and cut that type of jewel log by themselves, which has a very special meaning. And although I told you many people or live in the cities nowadays, but some of them still preserve this kind of tradition and try to go with their families to, to the woods. So let's now talk over a couple of surprising facts regarding Christmas. And let's go to the fact number one. Around 2 billion people celebrate Christmas around the world. So this definitely sounds like a lot, but uh, from this number, we can grasp uh, the dimensions of, of this holiday. Fact number two. First, Christmas tree decorations were actually different types of food. So now we do have uh, shiny and sparkly kinds of plastic or some sort of wooden decorations. But back then... Uh, people used apples, not dates, what they had to decorate those trees. And maybe that's where the culture of hanging uh, candies on the Christmas tree comes from. Fact number three, the idea of Santa Claus, as we think about him, was created by Washington Irving. So it's nothing that stands in Bible or somewhere else, but it was created much, much later by Washington Irving. Fact number four. Christmas jingles were actually composed for Thanksgiving rather than Christmas. So we all associate Christmas with Christmas jingles, but it's important to say that it was not meant for, for this holiday at all. Fact number five. Present giving. Here we are again. To those who can't or won't repay you, in the name of the Christ spirit is a great action by the culture. So people nowadays recommend um, this type of gift giving. Uh, we do culturally uh, tend to give presents to the dearest people to us and to our closest relatives and uh, significant people in our lives. But the culture suggests that we should be giving presents and giving something. It doesn't even have to be materialistic. To those people who can't or who won't repay you for for any reason. And the next fact, a legend says that couples that kiss under the mistletoe have their relationships sparked with peace and love. 
So a lot of people actually love this tradition a lot. Another very important fact to mention is the Christmas song. So when we think about Christmas, aside from jingles and Christmas tree or Santa Claus, we all tend to think nowadays about All I Want for Christmas is You from Mariah Carey. But what if I told you that that song, although our first idea of Christmas, it reminds us of Christmas, is not the actual Christmas song. So there is only one real Christmas song, as people say it, and that is Joy to the World. So what makes this song so special is that it actually is a repetition of God's promises and that it tells the value It speaks of values that we should live by and that we should be breathing by our whole beings all the year, not just on Christmas Day. And that's why joy to the world really should be more common and we should know and we should be reminding ourselves of this song a couple of times a year. So thank you for being with Learn Languages HD Audio. As we said in the beginning, Please make sure to learn something new and expand your horizons today. But in the spirit of Christmas, please don't forget to share what you know. Be good, stay good, stay safe, think good, do good things for other people. And we are sure that you're going to have a happy and successful life. Thank you for joining us and we really hope to meet you in the next episode. Bye bye. Hello everyone, welcome to the Learn Languages HD Audio Podcast. We love to have you with us. Make sure to learn something new today and expand your horizons for a little bit. This week, we are going to be talking about New Year. We will comment on popular New Year resolutions. However, we need to explain an important grammar concept, which is future tense, so that we could be talking about a future, about our predictions or plans anyways. So the topic for this week would be New Year resolutions and future tenses. Whether you are listening to this podcast because you want to learn grammar or just because you're very into the spirit of the upcoming holidays, we are sure that you're going to make a lot of use of this week's episode. So let's get started. It's a no-brainer that what our life is and what it's going to be comes down to a single thing, small decisions that we make daily. And it's tough for us people to accept that it is very little we could blame on the circumstances for the course of our lives. Life will give us hard lessons, of course, but we should realize something important and start this year off with this in mind. We for sure are in charge of our life and our future as we are in charge of our time. The beginning of each month always sounds fresh for new things. Moreover, the start of a new year brings special energy and encouragement. This period leaves some time for self-reflection and recapitulation of what has happened during the previous 12 months. And this analysis makes it clear This is what I'm not going to be doing anymore, or this is what I need to do more of. So New Year is a very special period, not just because of the joy that we find in the holiday season, or the celebrations, or parties, but it can give us an opportunity to start again, and to think about what we have done and what we can change when it comes to our life. But although we believe that New Year resolutions and this perspective, this way of thinking is something common to the modern days, it actually originates in a quite distant past. 
Back in ancient times, Babylonians were the ones to invent something quite equivalent to today's New Year resolutions. Some 4,000 years ago, Babylonians were the first to create the New Year celebration, and only for them, the year began in mid-March instead of January, when we celebrate it today, since that was when the crops were planted. So in those times, and it doesn't really have to be Asian times, like but back in the history when people, uh, people's lives relied completely on crops, they saw it as something extremely important. This was a religious ceremony, and it was known as a kitu. So during this holiday, Babylonians used to crown a new king or reaffirm the loyalty to the reigning king. The reigning king would be the king that is already on his duty. Babylonians also made promises to the gods to pay their debts or return any objects they had borrowed. These promises are considered the prototypes of New Year's resolutions. Babylonians also believed that if they kept to their word, their gods would bestow favor on them for the coming year. So they would be in favor of God and there would be a certain luck that would follow them throughout the year. It was thought that if they failed to keep the promises they have made before the new year, they would be out of God's favor, which for people who relied solely on crops would be devastating. In Rome, the emperor Julius Caesar reshaped the calendar and the year to start in January instead of March, or something similar, and his people believed in Janus. It was a god that inhabited doorways, and January, this month, had a special meaning for the Roman people. Uh, they imagined that the Janus looked back into the previous year and in the future as well, so Romans made promises for the following year to him. But today we don't refer to this practice as a religious custom, instead we promise to ourselves that we are going to change our life for a, a bit in the time that's coming, and uh, we make promises only to ourselves, not to any external power. And in case you haven't yet, maybe it's time to create your own resolution for this year. Uh, but maybe this time we can try doing it in English. And for that, we will need a bit of help so we can consult our grammar corner. When we talk about the future, it can be tricky since there are a couple of different forms we can use to express the future. We will quickly go over of the most important usage of future tenses so that we can later use them and create our own plans and predictions for the upcoming period. Will is the simplest future form. Although it can serve you well in different occasions, it is used for general future, so something that may happen or may not happen. And some of the examples could be we hope you will fly with us again. So when you were on a flight in the past, because now people don't really fly that often, but when we used to fly and travel, uh, we could hear this phrase often. So we hope you will fly with us again. I will create New Year decorations. So something very useful to say at a moment. And another usage of will would be for a spontaneous future. So for some decision about a future that you make right at a moment of speaking. For example, your friend says, I don't have any papers left, and then you say, I'll lend you some. I'll bring you some books to read. So you're talking to a friend, he says that he's bored, and then you just say, okay, I'll bring you some books to read. Be going to is another form that we use, and we intend it for intentions, and uh, for example, when we have intentions of doing something. For example, I'm going to practice more for this test. He is going to get a job after graduation. 
So those are the intentions of those people, like of these people. For example, when in the second example, when you said he's going to get a job after graduation, so probably you were talking to this person before this conversation and you were discussing his plans after graduation and that's what he said. He plans to, to get a job. So you can say he is going to get a job. Also, we can use we going to when we want to make some assumptions based on the evidence. So that's very important thing and I want to highlight it. When we base something with evidence, um, it it's, serves as a sign mark for you to use uh, going to as a form and make notice of this if you need to do some English tests or any sort of written practices of English grammar. For example, look at this traffic. We're not going to arrive home in the next two hours. So you see the traffic, that's your evidence for making this assumption that you're not going to arrive home in any time soon. For example, you could say, my grades are terrible, I'm going to fail this semester. So from what you can see from your grades at the moment, you can conclude that you're going to fail the semester, which is also an assumption. It doesn't have to happen, but you base it on certain evidence. Another form would be present continuous, and we cover that as a present time, but it can be used with following the same rules just in the future context. In this case, we use it for arranged future, for something that's agreed, uh, for agreements between two people, something that is arranged or set up already. So uh, we are seeing him tonight. We already arranged it, so we are seeing him tonight. Or what are you up to this summer? I'm traveling the world as a hitchhiker. Okay, and that's also something that you arranged previously. Our final form of future tense would be present simple for the future and we use it when the future we are discussing is defined by a schedule, by a certain timetable. So you could say the train leaves at 8 or a semester starts in mid-February, something that's planned and that's already set, maybe set in stone, we can see it in that context. Something that's already set and something that is defined by schedule, by calendar, timetable, or something similar. Since we are prepared for this conversation, we can start talking about how to make and keep our resolutions. Back to the times people made promises to God, so they kind of had uh, more of motivation to keep those promises and to make them true because they believed in that superpower and they believed that their lives are going to be ruined if they don't follow what they promised to do. Nowadays, we don't really have it. We rely only on ourselves and on our limited willpower. And that's why a lot of people find it hard to keep to their promises in this context, to the promises that we set for ourselves something as New Year resolution. If you are like most of the people, you probably failed to keep uh, your new year to your new year resolution. And actually, some studies showed that forty five percent of Americans make new year resolutions, but only eight percent of them are successful in keeping them. So, the vast majority of people actually fail to keep decisions they make. Scientists at two renowned Swedish universities. We can take a small break and discuss this word that I just mentioned. So I said renowned, renowned Swedish universities. So what does this word mean? Renowned stands for something famous, something well known, or something that's talked about in public. So something famous and known by a good word. That's another uh, good application of this word. So when someone or something is renowned for something, it means that they're famous because of they are doing something very well. It's a good context. It has a good connotation, positive connotation. So we said that scientists at 
two renowned Swedish universities conducted a study on these promising decisions and discovered that a key to success in keeping to your goal is actually the way you phrase your resolution. So this may be surprising or may not, but they meant that we will be more effective if we decide on what we are going to do instead of what we are not going to do. When we see some setbacks and see certain problems, we believe that we go by these negative formulations. For example, I will not procrastinate this year or I won't be eating sweets anymore. These experiments confirm that you are more likely to fail if you said I will not procrastinate this year compared to if you have said I will work more effectively. So their data proved that this positive connotation of deciding what you are going to do would help you a lot in achieving your goal. I also mentioned another new word that we can highlight for this time. It's called procrastinate. It's all over the internet and uh, you may have already wondered what does it mean if you came across this word in an article or in a YouTube video or in a podcast. So let's explain it. Procrastination refers to the act when we try to delay something or postpone some action that we have to take on. For example, people often use it in the case of work or schoolwork, housework, anything that is on your shoulders, some way that you have to do and you're not doing it. For example, you're watching a TV instead of doing your homework or you are scrolling through your social media instead of working. Those would be the forms of procrastination. In the same manner, in a renowned book called The Science of Habit, it is said that if you want to change something, you consider a bad habit in your life. This whole book is about the power of habit and how habit itself could change our lives. But we can leave that for another occasion and say that refer to this concept that is useful for a New Year resolution story. The author of this book claims that if we want to remove a bad habit, it's not enough just to remove it. We would be far more successful if we insert another good habit, a good one, instead of a bad one. The psychology proved that that's how our, how our mind works, actually. Specialists also recommend to be as specific as possible and to set clear but also short-term goals so we could make ourselves accountable and we could track our progress. Also, we should make sure that our decisions are attainable and achievable. And in the end, we should be declaring our statements publicly. We could share it with a friend or, or our significant others, whoever we find our support, social support, because it's proved that if we have support around us when we are trying to change something or build something in our lives, even though it doesn't sound very big or significant, having someone to share it with will help us stay on track and we will feel a responsibility to someone, not only to us as Babylonians or Romans uh, believe that uh, they had a responsibility towards God to keep their promises. So in the same manner, we should find our social support and try to communicate our ideas. As we have learned about this custom, we have also learned about necessary grammar for talking about it. In some new words, we could wrap it all up by making one collective New Year resolution. So we could bring up an imaginary person, our imaginary volunteer who would 
create a new year resolution and recap everything that we have covered today. So our representer would be Andrew K. And Andrew K. speaking. During this year, lockdowns changed my life. Being stuck at work from home mode, I found it hard to get used to it. I was very stressed and fell out of my usual routines. I don't read anymore. I don't cook as much as I used to. From what I achieved at work, my career is not going to get as high as I wanted it to be. And that's why I want to implement these rules for myself in this upcoming year. I will read a couple of pages of a book each morning while I drink my coffee. I will cook meals for the every lunch of the week on Sunday so I can eat healthy. I will work more effectively so I can spend more time with my family and friends. Our imaginary friend Andrew got this assignment right. And hopefully he inspired you to reflect on your 2020 and think of possible improvements for the upcoming 2021. Share your decisions with loved ones and you could also share it with us. Thank you for being with Learn Languages HD Audio today. We wish you happy holidays and a nice start of the new year. Again, Make sure to learn something new today and expand your horizons for a little bit, but also share it with someone else. Thank you for joining us and we really hope to meet you in the next episode. Bye-bye. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Learn Languages HD Audio Podcast. We love to have you with us and make sure to learn something new today and expand your horizons for a little bit. This is our first episode in 2021 and it is a fresh start for all of us. Therefore, we are going to do something a little bit different from usual. We'll be talking about you and how the alternative life conditions affect you and how could you make it a bit more pleasant or go through it after all. So today's topic is going to be on the coronavirus crisis, but from a little bit different perspective, from a little bit different point of view. It's about the time for me to properly introduce myself as well. I'm Mina, and I'm a college student from Montenegro. At the moment, I'm studying chemical engineering at the University of Montenegro. However, it is not what brought me here, what made me worth considering for the podcast at all. For years, I've been teaching English in various forms as a volunteer. I love languages, I enjoy learning and sharing what I know. It fulfills me, inspires me, makes me feel better about myself. After taking a variety of English exams, and some of them meant for natives, I gained a different perspective on education in general. I engaged in different seminars, different associations, and for a year I've been a full-time English tutor online, working with people from all over the globe, all ages, all levels of English experience. Aside, I'm a freelance writer working on other people's blogs and aspiring to develop my own. Well, I have been working from home completely online before the coronavirus pandemic and also during it. Also, I have been a student during the pandemic. Thus, I can start this story from my own point of view. Working online brings many benefits. It gives you freedom, flexibility to manage your own hours, and it's also very comfortable. For example, on rainy days or windy days, like wind can get very strong in my city. Actually, today is very windy and cold too, but on days like this, it feels very good to be at home in comfy clothes, in warm and pleasant, not to mention that 
this working style cuts commuting time and gives you an opportunity to focus more on yourself, doing something you enjoy or spending time with family. There are many benefits. However, there are certainly downsides too. For me personally and for some people I talk to, motivation is a great challenge when we have all this flexibility. It's all on us. It's on you. When are you going to wake up? When you're going to go to bed? Um, when are you going to take a lunch break? Or whether or not you're taking a walk? There is so much on you to decide. And that's why many people have faced um, a certain amount of decision fatigue. Because everything you do, there are no rules, there are no routines. Everything you should decide on yourself, by yourself. And you are responsible for all of your decisions, which is also very stressful. But after a certain time, you get really, people get stressed and burned out just with that decision fatigue. There are limited or no options for real or eye-to-eye communication, human interaction, which by our biology, our species needs. It is hard to measure your achievements, hard to work on your own. There are some companies and employers have figured it out well and try to reward their teams and stimulated their air jar department and everything. But it's not the case for everyone and not everyone had that chance. And that's why working on your own and seeing your own achievements can get quite intimidating. We are constantly surrounded by distractions. I have experienced several nervous breaks on the technical issues, such as the internet stops working completely, all of a sudden, unexpectedly, or a computer running into a sudden and very long update when I have a full day of lectures scheduled ahead. So those are some of the setbacks that we cannot really control. And that can give us hard time when we are trying to adapt to these uh, working conditions. Studying from home partially or completely also gives you an advantage of more time for studying, like less commute, um, less time spent with friends, and thus you, at least hypothetically, have more time for studying. Time management is more flexible, and this is an opportunity also to give a shout out to professors, teachers, and other education workers who have been trying hard to accomplish their mission in cruel conditions set by coronavirus pandemic, where we had to substitute the very essence of the job, the classroom, the interaction with alternatives. And students worldwide recognize these efforts and highly appreciate it. Many studies have been done on the effectiveness of these methods of living style it for sure has been a shaping experience, professionally and privately. But one thing I got to hear a lot from students and friends studying in the United States, Japan, Thailand, South Korea, Spain, Slovenia, and other Balkans, Austria, and so on, that we are having a hard time. We are missing on experiences important for our careers. And the list could go on. We could continue listing positive and negative aspects of working and studying from home on and on. But one thing is for sure, when it keeps on going, it gets harder to enjoy the benefits the situation provides. I've seen a video just the other day where the family compared life in quarantine back in March to today's situation. And it is a meme, it's interesting, it's funny video, but... Um, in general, I could really relate to that, although it was a parody, it was, it was meant to entertain us, but um, under it all, I could really recognize a lot of truth. The overall point is that we should not be hard on ourselves. It is hard to keep up with everything that's going on. We live in fear and in the conditions that are not so natural. After the lockdowns became so normal, Unfortunately, we stopped seeing 
articles on how to manage these conditions, how to go through the situation, ideas, benefits, advice. On the news, people don't talk about this backbone, about how the overall situation affects our day-to-day life. And I made this episode to point out that although this becomes normal, it shouldn't be taken like it. It should not be assumed that we got used to it. Because as we have seen, the more it goes on, the more challenges it brings. So in 2021, keep in touch with your people. Listen to each other. Help your friend with whatever he deals with. Think about yourself and your own priorities. Think again of your goals. And we as people would go through this whole thing together. As the Tarif research has supported above presented statements, I'm going to present some advice for if you have Zoom fatigue, if you struggle with taking the exams, keeping up with deadlines at work, for if the initial excitement of working from home has worn off for you, or if you just want to make lockdown more pleasant for yourself. I will use the structures should and ought to. These are the most common model verbs to use for giving advice in English language. It's important to see a slight difference here. When we say you should go see a doctor, you should travel to another city on Friday and see what they have to offer for this issue. We should see each other more often. We have this structure should that is followed by infinitive. So you should see, you should go. There is another phrase, oath to. We use to infinitive, not bare infinitive as we used it with should, but to infinitive. For example, you ought to go, you ought to see. We should not forget this, this slight difference here. These are other ways to give someone a word on a problem is to use indirect questions like why don't you travel, why don't you go see someone, why don't we go to the cinema next week, for example. Or you could use another structure, which is if I were you, I would. So if I were you, I would work more to solve this problem. If I were you, I would see my friends more often. If I was in your place, like if it was my life, this is what I would do. So a good idea to give someone an advice that you really stand behind. And this statement, if I were you, this structure is is a conditional statement, which sooner or later you're going to cover in depth. But just as you know it, as an example, something that you should use and you could use to give someone advice. And when you're talking to someone in English or if you, as many other people worldwide now, started meeting friends online through different chat groups and different applications, using English as a common language is a challenge. So these are just some ideas that would help you around. So the very first advice I have for you is that you should figure out what moves you. You should figure out what feels good for you, what are your passions, what are your goals. Figure out what motivates you, what inspires you, and try to incorporate that into your daily routine. We often forget that going on and living and accomplishing something from time to time requires a bit of introspection, seeing what you feel comfortable with, Thinking about yourself and the way you're dealing with things, the way you live, the way you work, the way you communicate, seeing what you can change or what you can be doing more of. And in this time, more than ever before, it's quite necessary to sit down and think, talk to yourself and see what you can do to feel better. And then why don't you do more of it? Another thing that is proven to be helpful in this situation and that is recommended by psychologists is to set deadlines. If you don't have specific deadlines, like I didn't have uh, when it comes to my work, I didn't have any boundaries, any rules that 
I should follow, for example, how much I should work, uh, what are the days I should be working, what are my working hours, everything was on me to choose. So the way to go through it successfully and with less frustration was to set my own deadlines and my own rules for the game. Psychologists say that these times when it comes to coronavirus, constant changes, checking up the news, counting the infected people, uh, listening about how many people died daily, it all brings a lot of frustration and also um, a lot of challenges and uh, an urge to adapt and to compromise. We are constantly in need to adapt. And that's where decision fatigue also comes from. So psychologists and other experts recommend that we should try to set our routines. When we set routines and rules that we go by, we are limited the number of decisions that we ought to make daily. So therefore, we will ease the tension in our brain and the place where there is awfully a lot going on in this period, it would help us with all the inner struggles and it would kind of ease our mind. So setting the routines, deadlines, and certain plans would be very beneficial. Of course, it's something that it maybe is not so familiar to you, setting a goal, and maybe then we could struggle with how to keep up with that. But once we do that successfully for at least a couple of days, we will see a great transformation and we would feel a spike in our motivation level. So starting with something small, with um, very simple, attainable goals and fulfilling those daily would make a good change for you, according to psychologists and many people who have experienced it already. The working from home environment or studying from home environment, as research says, this environment doesn't give many opportunities, many opportunities for rewards. If we were in the office, we could be getting incentives, we could have um, talks with our boss, with our coordinators, our colleagues, we could measure our success and our success and our work could be recognized. Psychologically, our brain works on rewards. And that's something that um, kept us going through the hard days back then when we were working in unrestricted conditions. Nowadays, we could find ways to reward ourselves. Whatever it is and whatever the area of work you're doing, whatever you consider an accomplishment, try when you achieve something to um, give yourself a little reward in any form you prefer. It's also recommended to take breaks, regular breaks. I know that when you're working from home, it's quite hard to distinguish, to make a boundary between private life and working life. It's hard to decide what the break is. It's hard to do focused work and that's why we feel like we don't deserve breaks. But sometimes a little bit of getaway, a little bit of getaway or just forgetting, easing your mind, giving yourself a complete psychological break from everything that's going on would also help you and stimulate your further your further work. And another big thing to say is that we should not be comparing ourselves. But all of this advice stands for studying and working from home or just dealing with the situation. We have seen via social media how people used lockdown to create, to build the new routines, new habits, to try something new, to start working out, start something, start something major, write a book, whatever. People, some people made the difference, use this time effectively. However, it shouldn't, it can't be that way for everyone. 
So as students, we should not be comparing our grades and our functioning system with our friends, um, not in a bad way. We could consult our friends, we could see how they do and maybe ask them for advice, trying to change something in our own functioning, but we should not feel inferior to anyone just because we are not keeping the track with everything or if we are not making as much progress as someone next to us, we should not consider that a barrier or not an internal struggle. The same goes for work. Don't compare to your colleagues, don't compare to your significant others, your um, brothers, sisters in general. Don't compare to peers and to people around you because everyone has their own way of functioning. And as I always love to say, different people do things differently, different people think differently, and different people live differently. That's why you should. Back to the first advice, um, think about yourself, figure out what is good for you, what makes you feel better, what excites you, what motivates you, and try to keep on going with that. So thank you for being with us in the first episode for 2021. It was a little bit different than usual, but I hope that you gained some value from this talk, that you feel better more inspired, or more motivated to continue your day. Thank you for being with us. Make sure to learn something new today and expand your horizons for just a little bit. Have a great day. See you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Learn Languages HD Audio Podcast. We love to have you with us. Make sure to learn something new today and expand your horizons for a little bit. December, January, and February are known to the students' population worldwide as months that are in red for a stress zone. That's where most of the countries worldwide and for university students and for high school students perform final examination. That's why we wanted to dedicate this episode to all of you who have or who had already had trouble with the stress and dealing with the stress of the examination season. Also, it was a good chance for us to talk about the balance, to talk about the balance between studying and working or between um, your personal life and your working life, your business life. So all of us tend to fall in that trap of sometimes giving too much on one end and completely forgetting about the other things and responsibilities that we have, or we just find it so overwhelming to be on all of those places in the same time being. And that's something that we can't do much about. Basically, in our lives, we have to encounter uh, multiple roles. So we are both parents and uh, business people or we're both students and we are supposed to work or we all have different responsibilities and balancing those out in the same time can get quite stressful at times and that's why we thought that this could be a right moment to introduce that topic give you some advice on how to help yourself in those situations it seems like a good start of the year to acquire that new skill of dealing with stress that new responsibilities and new events bring in our lives. First of all, when we focus on student population, many times people ask themselves, why do I need this? Like, why shouldn't I just, or why couldn't I just sit in my room with the book, complete my studying responsibilities, and that's all? In many countries, however, that's still a problem that those kinds of extracurricular activities or self-improvement on the other levels that are not strictly connected or tied to school are not appreciated enough at the moment. But a positive example 
of the systems that incorporated these activities into their curriculums or into the general acceptance, generally socially approved, those kinds of activities and involvement systems that stimulate that kind of response, we could say that the United States is quite good there. Why United States? For example, if you want to apply to the university in the United States, you have to, aside from your grades and school transcripts and everything else you do in school, like how you behave and etc., you have to present what else you did, how else you stand out and what makes you different. So basically, you could show your hobbies, you could show your other responsibilities, tasks, anything that involves you in community, any community, anything that makes you more well-rounded person and personality. You could also ask at this point, why are the schools interested in that kind of information? Why do I need that? Well, we could simply answer that. So all the things that you do outside of your studies, no matter what degree you are on, so whether you're a college student or a high school student or even elementary school student, everything you do outside of your studies contributes to your overall experience. It enriches you as a person and also makes you better for the other tasks. For example, it will make your, it will make your critical thinking better or all those activities would sharpen your other skills, which would certainly contribute to your professional development and to your academic achievements. Another thing important to mention is that not even schools expect you to study 24-7. Although your studying is treated like a full-time responsibility, still they calculate your involvement hours per week to around 30 to 35 hours, which basically leaves a lot of space for other things to be incorporated too. So if you commit yourself to well-defined study times, you would have a lot of a lot of time left to enjoy a range of different activities of your choice. I already said that activities that you complete outside of your um, first responsibilities in life, let's define it that way, really make you grow better as a person, not just professionally, but also when it comes to your um, general virtues and to you as a person. They make you a better human being. They also make you feel happier. So for example, if you work nine to five or even longer than that, in many countries, it's quite common for people to work way above nine to five daily, having some hobby, having some sort of occupation to vent out the stress and to clear your mind, having some space to let you breathe would definitely stimulate you, make you more productive, make you more engaged and generally make you happier. And when you're happier, you're better for everyone around yourself and for any sort of work that you're involved in. For students, one of the motivations I already mentioned the example of the United States. One of the motivations to participate in your community or generally to engage in a lot of different things could be professional development. For example, if you're aiming to achieve some high scores, if you're aiming for certain scholarships, certain medals, certain championships, competitions, whatever it is, to have some sort of formal recognition of your success, That's one of the very good motivators for the start. But it definitely shouldn't be the only one because everything you do in your life defines who you are going to be. Every opportunity you take enriches you in numerous ways. And since we already met, I find it appropriate to give some examples from my personal life. When I was elementary school students and student and also high school student, I was very active. Although it is not so common in my community, we are not stimulated to engage anything other than school formally. So for example, if you submit to the university, if you apply, no one has any chance of looking at you as a person, like what you do, what are your hobbies, what were you involved in, all that matters are your grades. 
And yeah, the, it is what it is. We can change that at the moment. But still, recently, schools, when I say recently, I really mean a couple, maybe like last decade or maybe last five years, schools slowly started to encourage these kinds of activities to students, especially to gifted students. Schools started to encourage their students to involve and to participate because from that educational point of view, it's very beneficial to the person and to your overall personal, emotional development. Also, social development counts. So over the range of my whole studies, I was involved in different set of activities. So I was always in a choir. I was always a performer. I was always a dancer. I used to write. I used to volunteer. And I, it wasn't before I started, before I joined certain clubs, I didn't realize how much actually I loved volunteering. Like I would never think of it in a younger age. And what I found there is not only that I felt, that I felt very satisfied while doing it, that I felt happy. It's that I made so many connections. I made so many friends that are not from my high school, that are not from my class, that are not from my neighborhood. I got to meet a lot of different people. I got to meet people from all over the globe. Also, I got to learn a lot of skills. As a volunteer in an NGO, I learned how to run projects. I learned how to create content, visual content. Like it was the first time to be presented with a certain software for producing different visual content. And I loved it. And later on in my career, even though it wasn't so, so long ago, I had many chances to use those skills and to use that program. And I got to use it better with time. But it wasn't before I was given the responsibility. So my mentors in the organization found it appropriate to give to me as a 16-year-old at a time to completely create by myself all of the materials for a campaign. So that organization old, uh, that organization deals with public health. So every December when we celebrate the International Day of Fight Against HIV, they create something special to the community. And that year, they gave me the chance to translate certain messages and to create visuals for their uh, posters, for their billboards, and for their social media. For me, it was a huge thing, a huge responsibility, but it taught me a few things. Not to mention that some of my first experiences teaching English were actually as a volunteer in American Corner in my country. There, I got those first moments when I was standing in front of a class. It was an extracurricular activity for students. So for the low-income families who cannot afford certain paid recreational activities or extra educational activities to their kids, they could bring them to the American Corner where us volunteers would be teaching them for free. I got to meet some great children. I got to inspire them and I got to share what I know with them. And it was not only rewarding, but it also taught me a handful of skills, professional as well as social. In my grade three, of high school, I got an opportunity to apply for a scholarship to the Yale University summer program in the United States. And I got to hear about it from my advisor in the American corner where I was volunteer at the time. I applied and one of the things that I still believe that got me there and that earned me that scholarship, aside from my grades, were the fa was the fact that I was actually a very active volunteer and that I was a very active participator in their community. So the admissions team believed that if I could come there, if I could meet new people, learn some new things, I could happily share it with my community and spread it as widely as possible, which was actually the truth. Not only did I was able to meet top professors, 
at that university or to see some extraordinary facilities and enjoy the spirit of the campus and of the local students. And it wasn't only that I got to learn so much about science, which is basically my major and my first passion, I also got to meet people from everywhere around the world. In that period, my roommate was from Africa, from Senegal, and I'm all the way in Europe. And that's where I made one of the lifetime friendships. It was just one of the benefits that I got from engaging in my community and um, into different activities. I also got to learn responsibility, taking risks, organizing time, and also I also got to learn courage and independence at a very young age, and I believe that it really helped my career and it helped me get where I am at the moment, and I hope that if I keep going that way, it's gonna also help me fly higher. At the moment, I'm a student. And I'm also working as a freelancer. And I believe that I'm already making a lot of use of skills that I acquired previously and that I've mentioned. And that's why I thought that my personal story would be interesting and stimulating to you to see that everything can be somehow balanced out if we try and if we keep learning, growing, and keep fighting and trying. So in today's lesson, we prepared some of the general advice that could help you deal with stressful situations and help you manage your time better so that you can enjoy all the perks that active involvement in life can bring you. And a small explanation, a small note that I haven't mentioned before, uh, but I find it to be very important, it doesn't have to be involving in activity doesn't have to be that you do something somewhere and something incredible. It can be something that you do just for yourself. So if you like reading, um, I'm here to tell you that you don't have to say, okay, now I'm working, now I'm studying, now I have exams, I don't have time for that. Or if you're really passionate about sports, you can happily incorporate that in your schedule and enjoy growing on both of the sides of your life. Also, it could be social life. Like many students have that trouble if they are very successful educationally. They've found it hard to maintain active social life, which also doesn't have to be the fact. So here are our our tips and general advice. If you find yourself in that situation or if you know someone who can benefit from this idea. First advice would be to create clear boundaries. That's something that many people complained about when it came to whole COVID situation and lockdowns that when working from home, they find it really hard to uh, make a boundary, set a boundary between their private time and between their working time. So in this case, we can also understand it the same way so that you need to make a time, like time slots, time boundary between everything you want to incorporate in your daily routines, but also create clear boundaries for me signifies that you should think about what makes you happy, what you enjoy, what is that that really is your passion and what is that that you really want to commit for. And it leads to the fact that You should create clear boundaries in time, but you should also create and set specific goals for yourself or specific intentions. They don't have to be something measurable. For example, I would read 20 pages a day, or I would go for uh, a marathon, or I would, my goal is to get a promotion. Doesn't have to be like that. It can be just your own personal intention, but it has to be clear. You have to know what is that that you want to really commit to. Second piece of advice would be to take control. Especially in these stressful situations, we feel like we're out of control of our time, of our life, that we're just like puppets on the strings, and definitely someone else is pulling the strings. That's not the truth. That's something that I have to tell you. So you should organize yourself and don't let activities overwhelm you. When I say organize, it doesn't really 
mean to only to organize your time. It means to organize your life, whatever that signifies for you. For me, it was to organize my storage space, to organize my closet, to organize my digital files, to kind of create certain tidiness all around me. And that will help me also be clear, more clear in my mind and help me organize my time accordingly. Um, some specific tools that could help you with getting organized um, are, for example, Microsoft To-Do as a very useful and neat software for creating to-do lists and all the other sorts of lists you can title them any way you want. It has very clear interface and is easy to use and to set as you want. And you can connect it to your PC since it's a Microsoft. Since it's a Microsoft software, there is a high chance that you already have it installed on your computer or your phone. So why don't you give it a try? Um, another very famous tool at the moment is Notion. It's like a note-taking app. Generally, it started as a note-taking software. So many students worldwide use it to take their notes and to organize their educational life before a new semester or over the semester. But people also use it to organize all different sets of things. So there you can find templates for project organization, or you can just create it on your own. That's something that really makes this application stand out, that you can frame it any way you want. So basically you can make it a to-do list, you can make it a, you can make it your diary, you can make it your school notebook, whatever you want. And you can also create the interface any way you like. And a good thing is that there are plenty of resources and tutorials online on how to use Notions and Notion and also all different sets of ideas, how you can implement it, like what people use it for. So it can maybe give you some ideas how you could benefit from the software. Other people really don't prefer going all digital with those kind of stuff. And partially I'm like that. I do use Notion and I did use uh, Microsoft to do, but when I'm really into a stressful situation, I really prefer going completely analog, like taking a notebook or a pen and piece of paper and writing down what's in my head, trying to organize it um, on the paper seems like seems to be much easier than it is to do it in my head. Another advice that is related to student situation is to study with others. Many students claim that when they feel very stressed, they lose motivation somehow. It's maybe not so logical, but um, after a longer period of time, we do tend to experience certain burnout, certain lack of will and motivation. And that's where studying with others could help you with. Not only that that would keep you accountable, but it will it would help you to get yourself to do it. So if you already scheduled a session with your friends, you're far less likely to actually cancel it and not to study. And there is that psychological trick that when you're doing it with others, you would be comparing yourself to them. So if you see all of them studying, you would feel bad not to do so. And you will start or you will be just staring at a book and somehow you will get to go through it. This actually works for the business life as well. If you have a difficult project that you feel really stressed about and that troubles your mind, but you feel very hard to get yourself to do it and to concentrate on it, then if you just share your working space with someone, you don't really have to be working on the same project. Okay. It could be your husband or your significant other or your family members, your friends, you could be just sitting in the same space. And while you're together, you will feel more strength and more power to embark on your own tasks. Another advice that I used to hear often is to study in small chunks. For example, to use Pomodoro technique, which actually is a studying technique or working technique in general, where you do 20 I think it was 25, actually, 25 minutes of concentrated work. And then you give yourself five minute breaks. And then you continue with another 25 minute session. 
and I think you then complete four 25 minute sessions and then you take half an hour break or something like that. I really forgot since I haven't used that method in a while, but many people benefit from it and there are many timers like just intended for that technique, Pomodoro timers, applications for that. If you have troubles motivating yourself to start, it could definitely, you could definitely make use of it. But another thing that I found in a YouTube video, and it really works for me better than studying in small chunks, is a technique with study blocks. So I was watching it on a YouTube channel of a medical student, and he says that he actually divides his work into two four-hour sessions. And why he does it that way? Because if you sit for a longer time in uninterrupted environment, if you do uninterrupted and continuous work, you're far more likely to get into the zone and you will probably give out better results. This technique is really all about minimizing distractions and staying there for a longer period of time, which I found to be very useful, especially for university students, since the tasks you gotta do are probably larger than for the other students. And maybe for the business world, Pomodoro technique would work better. It really depends on what you do, actually. But uh, the whole idea behind it is that you don't have to get yourself to do something multiple times a day. Using this technique, you would have to make that effort to start only two times. You study for hours and then you give yourself one hour, two hour break, and then you do another session for four hours. So you ultimately use less of the willpower. You have to waste less of the willpower to get yourself to do it. And imagine you were just sitting there and trying to study and whenever your phone beeps, you would be checking it and then you have to get into the studying or working mode again. So I really love this one. And if you don't want to do it for four hours, it could be two or one hour and a half or three hours. Doesn't really matter, but it's just that you uh, cut on the time and cut on the breaks and that you actually cut on the willpower that you have to invest into getting yourself to do something. Whatever it is that you're going through at the moment, whatever you're dealing with, I hope that this episode would inspire you to think what else you can do for yourself. What are the other things in your life that you can, that you can incorporate? Whether it is a new hobby, new skill, new activity, spending more time with friends, family, spending more time studying, getting a part-time gig, whatever it is, um, try to think what else you can do for yourself and think about what you do and think about how you do it, how you spend your time and where there is a room for improvement. Because if you improve the way you're spending your time, if you work on that quality, ultimately you will raise the quality of your future and of your well-being. Thank you for being with us. I hope you had a good time and I really hope to meet you soon again in the next episode. Bye-bye. Hello everyone. Welcome to the Learn Languages HD audio podcast. We'd love to have you with us. Make sure to learn something new today and expand your horizons for a little bit. Recently, I have seen an interesting movie, and it's called Blade Runner. To me, there was something very special about it, and that's why I decided to have it as a subtopic of today's episode. Uh, Our topic for today would be future world and how actions of the mankind could affect the way our planet and our environment and our living would be in the future. Language-wise, we would also cover conditional sentences, which is a grammar structure that many students uh, for some reason find difficult to understand at first, 
but it's a grammar structure that has um, numerous applications, both in spoken and written communication in English. So I believe it's very necessary to learn it sooner or later. So at some point during this episode, we will quickly explain this concept and we would use it to make a couple of sentences. So when I said the Blade Runner, you may have wondered, what is that actually? Because that's the question that I asked myself too when uh, a friend recommended me to watch this movie. Well, Blade Runner is a job, is an occupation, is a career of the future, as the directors and creators of this movie defined it. So the Blade Runner is like a police detective that is running and chasing replicants. And the replicants are the humans of the future. They are genetically modified individuals, which at the point where this action takes place, um, don't differ a lot from regular people. And it takes long examinations and different sorts of tests to determine whether a person is a replicant or not. And the companies that are producing them are actually doing their best to remove that difference, to make them as similar to humans as possible. And they kind of succeeded in that, because in the first movie we get to meet a replicant it, that was very hard to spot. It was very hard to determine that 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 she actually is not the real human being. So uh, there are two Blade Runner movies, one created in 1982, and there the main actor is a Blade Runner, and he's brought to the planet to run and find four replicants that are actually criminals that have committed various crimes and that authorities considered a threat to the world. At that point, replicants had one and only role in the society, and that was the role of slaves. They lived on a different planet from Earth, and they were used to they were used as a socially approved slaves to the people of those days. While the Blade Runner is hunting them, he actually meets experiences that would change his lifetime forever and his future forever. In the second movie, which was filmed in nineties, uh, which was filmed in twenty seventeen, and is called uh, Blade Runner twenty forty nine, another a new young Blade Runner K discovers a long buried and well protected secret that actually leads him to the. A former Blade Runner from the first episode, Rick Deckard, who has gone missing for 30 years. So the second movie actually is the story that happens 30 years later from the, from the first part. What was striking to me when it comes to this movie is that I sort of, when I saw it first time, I sort of thought, wow, this may not, may, this may be a sci-fi in the moment, like when the first one was created, it's 1982. Maybe that's how they perceive the future, and I actually recognize some of the elements of their environment. I could see that in our days, and maybe something that was sci-fi then, and that, that is sci-fi now, uh, would actually come alive and real in the future. What was striking is that it's always dark. They're riding, they're riding through the air, they're, they have flying cars. Everything works and looks different, but it still has uh, very striking similarities to the world we're living in. And this movie brought me to thinking about how climate change and how our actions as people actually are changing the environment and changing the future that we live in. Uh, for a young individual, many studies that I have read talking about the predictions for our future are very frightening. 
and the fact that we are that changes in our weather patterns are already so visible and maybe on the European continent not as much as those are on Asian continent or some some other countries worldwide really got me to the point that maybe we are not talking about it enough so we have issues with covid we have issues with politics worldwide and there are many other things that are certainly um categorized as priorities of the mankind at the moment and let's say problems of the highest priority to be solved but if we tend to be forgetting these very crucial moments these this very ongoing and dramatic problem that's been going on for years um and do nothing about it on a daily basis where that's going to lead us so that's the power and those are the questions that this movie opened to me and i thought that it might be useful to talk about the climate change and to talk about how science and all the achievements that we have today can actually help with the situation we live in i believe as a young individual that um young people are those that actually hold a lot of responsibility at the moment although we believe that as teenagers or young grown-ups we don't really have much of the power to change anything or maybe even as parents we don't believe that we can influence the ongoing situations that got to be worrisome and i believe that uh in developed countries these topics are even more pr- prioritized than in the countries that are developing so here goes the list of the activities one can take every day to help fight global crises help fight this global crises and maybe we could and maybe we could send the broader message that whatever crises and whatever happens whether it is climate change or problems with covid or whatever problems we may have in our personal lives uh, realize that it has something to do with us and uh, our daily lives nothing can actually be solved so there is the term that is called carbon footprint and when i first got to know about it um it taught me that carbon footprint nationwide is calculated from the data of individuals so we can calculate carbon footprint personally or on the basis of our family or on our community like school community or on our city it can be calculated on various different levels but what it's nothing else than a sum of all of our actions and interactions if you can guess what i'm saying and that's why the first advice actually tells and one of the components um one of the aspects that is used in the calculation of one's carbon footprint is their energy consumption so the first the the first advice i have here is that we should use energy wisely and by doing that we are not only saving planet but we are also saving money too and there is a fact that canada is the top per capita so per capita means per person per a citizen energy consumer in the world and it's believed that if we become more energy efficient we would not only be polluting less around but we would also be saving a lot on our budget and believe it or not it can be done by making some very very tiny changes and when you incorporate that and uh really stay persistent with it it can add up and create very big difference so one of the uh one of the things you can do is to actually install a programmable thermostat at your home you could also swap your gas stove for an electric stove and it will also indoor it will also lower the indoor air pollution you can unplug computers TVs chargers and all the other electronic devices when you're not specifically using them you can wash clothes in cold water instead of hot water and you can hang dry your clothes when you can and when you cannot you can use different dryer products that are not electric a little bit extra on clothes washing would be that leaving out the chemicals like detergents and 
uh, different soaps, different smelly soaps would actually not only be beneficial to the planet and to the ecosystem, but would be also beneficial to one's health because the chemicals that are contained in those products go into your breathing system, into your lungs, and could severely damage your health. When you're buying new household appliances, you can uh, take a look into their energy labels and try to find some that are labeled Energy Star or eco-friendly. You could also work on the windows and on doors at your apartment or your house to prevent heat actually from going out of your place and try to keep it um, as warm as possible in the winter by spending less on the heating system and if you really take care of the quality of the of the quality of your windows and doors in your household you would be also spending less in the summertime for a cooling system take a look at energy efficient light bulbs and get a home or a workplace energy audit to identify where you can make the most energy saving gains. Another option, if applicable, if possible, is to try to go renewable with your energy sources. Um, I've seen that recently that in my country, many households have started in implementing the solar panels on top of their roofs and the fact that that energy is accumulating, it is quite of an investment at the beginning. But over a longer period of time, it would definitely give you uh, a lot of benefits money-wise. If you don't really have a lot of information on the renewable energy sources and the way you can implement it and use it, there are many resources online where you can also be reading some stories uh, from the people who had experienced it and they are find inspiration for yourself. Believe it or not, our eating habits also affect planet largely and those decisions that we make daily do not affect our health only in a hormonal way like whether you're eating a lot of carbohydrates at that moment or you're eating something with a lot of protein but they also affect your chain uh, uh, they also affect your health on a larger scale let's say so what you can do to be more to make your diet more climate stable and more um, eco-friendly is to eat more meat-free meals. So to try to go, I don't say that you should go vegan or vegetarian, but you should try to incorporate as much of plant-based diet as possible and as much as you like. And it will also help your health, internal health a lot. You could try buying organic products and local products whenever possible. Uh, I believe that COVID situation really taught us that we should rely as much as possible on the local food producers and generally on the local producers of everything that's available and using our native resources instead of importing lower class products from the other countries. We shouldn't be wasting food. And that's a huge problem worldwide that there are many campaigns that are trying to solve it for many years that while some in some countries people are dying out of hunger, in some countries there is so much of the food waste produced, and there are even greater concerns when it comes uh, to that waste. It's not that only we waste our money and our resources, but um, it, it's very important to take care of how we store that kind of waste, because if we do that effectively, um, it doesn't have to be that hazardous. And another great advice is to grow our own food. In my country, there are a lot of agriculture resources and households. I did experience and saw what it is to create your and to plant your own food. And it's not only that it's healthy in all possible ways, but it's also really rewarding and satisfying. And last but not least is that we should be having climate conversations. And young people especially should feel like that should feel like those topics are natural and normal and that those topics are supposed to be brought up in our day to day conversation with people, uh, with friends, with peers, with in school, wherever possible, and that shouldn't be worrisome conversation. It should be something that 
inspires and moves us because we will be sharing same ideas and trying to. You don't even have to be engaging. We would be sharing same ideas, same goals, and same perspectives. And therefore, we could be contributing on the variety of levels. Another great idea that could be implemented that you can create a club, for example. And one example is Green Commute, so that you can have a bicycle club or a walking club and that you can try to reduce your own personal carbon footprint by walking to school, walking to work, or maybe just riding your bike. And you can make yourself, you can make yourself healthier mentally, physically, and also you will be doing something for a greater good. Since we mentioned conversations, and since I told you that this topic is quite viral worldwide, and it should be even more, and I hope and believe that it's gonna get more present in the future. Um, I'm here to present conditionals as well. Um, if, especially if you're a student, uh, there is a high possibility that at one point or another, you will be writing certain essays or comments on this topic. Um, I, get, I got it on my TOEFL examination. Um, and when I was practicing for ACTs, I also encountered many times to write something about ecology or sustainability, eco-friendliness, or something like that. So conditional sentences are hypothetical sentences, and there are four different types of it. But we don't say first, second, third, and fourth, but we say zero, first, second, and third conditional. Each of those is formed differently and is used in a different situation. And zero conditional is something that you use when you want to state a fact, scientific fact that is generally true, something like as present simple. You use it for general truth and events that are always like that. And it's formed with present simple and present simple. So you have first sentence and second sentence. And in both of those, we say it if clause, regular clause, and in both clauses, you use present simple tense. For example, if you stand in the rain, you get wet. If you heat ice, it melts. Always true, generally true. It reminds you of present simple, and that's why you use present simple if both, in both if clause and subordinate clause. When it comes to first conditional, it is used to po it's used for possible situations in the future when you're predicting. A likely result in the future and that's why I thought it's appropriate to use it when we are talking about future world and climate, ch climate change. For example, this one we form with present simple but in present simple in the if clause but in the subordinate clause you don't use present simple rather you use will plus verb so you use a future simple tense. For example, if it rains we will cancel the trip. If you study, you will pass the exam. So the likely result of the actions. Second conditional would be used for hypothetical or unlikely situations. People usually mix up these two because first conditional is used for possible situations in the future, predictable outcomes. While second conditional is completely hypothetical and unreal or improbable situations in the future. It still could happen, but the possibility is quite low. And we form it with past simple and if clause and would plus verb in the subordinate clause. So if I won the lottery, I would travel a lot. Or if they sold their house, they would be rich. If, they're, if they created engineered humans, they would look completely different from us. Something like that. So when if you want to engage in conversations that are predictive, that are hypothetical, I believe that you can uh, be using conditionals quite a lot and that you will tie the condition, certain condition, and the result, which can be always true, probable or improbable, depending on your point. So hope you learned something today, hope you got inspired once again, and I really hope that we could see you in another episode. There are more interesting topics yet to come, and hope you will stay with us. Have a good day, and thank you. Bye-bye. 
Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Learn Languages HD audio podcast. We love to have you with us. Make sure to learn something new today and expand your horizons for a little bit. In this episode, we are going to do something slightly different from usual. I'm going to give you my top 10 movies to watch if you're tired, if you're just about to get on a vacation, or if you're planning Valentine's Day movie night special. I guess that lockdowns worldwide do not leave us with many options for entertainment or these kinds of holidays. So whatever the occasion, I hope that you will make use of some of my suggestions. Also, since we mentioned in our first podcast episode, when we were talking about language learning in general, um, then we mentioned that watching content in the language of your niche is something that will improve your aspects, all of your skills in that language dramatically. And movies were one of my recommendations. If you haven't, if you haven't listened to that episode yet, make sure to check it um, after this one. And I hope that it will, I'm sure it will provide you with a lot of useful evidence when it comes to language learning. Anyways, then we have mentioned that watching movies could help you dramatically in in improving your skills and how it can do so. You play the movie, hopefully, preferably in the language that you strive to learn, and then you put on the subtitle in the same language. So not on your, not your mother tongue subtitle, but on the language that you're trying to improve. So for instance, all the movies that I will list today would be originally made in English and you can put on English subtitle for the maximum benefits because at the same time you can hear the correct pronunciation and you can read it and that helps you put your grammar into practice it helps you learn vocabulary quicker because you saw real life applications of the content that was presented so we advise you to try using different contents when it comes to language learning. Podcast is one of the ideas, but in your free time, you can expand it to the other sources. As well, This in this episode, we are going to cover narration and description, but I'm not going to be explaining it in depth uh, because I believe that when your aim of learning a language is to communicate and to expand your circle of friends worldwide, or communication for your business, um, whatever that it is, people learn language to use it. And that's why I like to embrace this kind of approach. And in this episode, I will be describing my top 10 movies and you can make use of some of the, some of the phrases, expressions in my style of doing it. And maybe in the future, when you're meeting people online through different groups or when you get in the chance to, you know, of using that language. Anyways, you can bring those up and be confident starting the conversation yourself. So my number one would be Green Mile with Tom Hanks as the main character. It was created in 1999 and on IMBD, which is one of the uh, movie review websites. Um, I, it's a small digression, but I really want to take a moment to honor them. Um, they give great recommendations and reviews of any possible movie you can think of, more or less. And whenever you don't have any ideas what you should watch and what you should do, I really advise you to take a look into their um, top 100 movies ever list. I think it's called exactly like that, but you can just type in IMBD 100 movies and they will order it in a descending order from the top to the last one based on the overall grade. People, when they are reviewing a certain movie, they vote and they leave their their comments. So that's how they calculate that mark. And most of the movies that I listed here uh, scored very highly. 
So I really do advise you to take a look into their list. So Green Mile earned 8.6, which is quite a lot when you compare it to the others. I don't think they have a clear score 10 at all, but 8.6 is quite successful. It's based on Stephen King novel and through the flashbacks um, of an aged narrator, they show how the guards, how the guards in certain prison in times of Great Depression deal with convicts that are assigned death punishment. And they also show how they react and how they deal with one special convict that has very special gift. So I'm not going to tell you anything more than that about the plot because everything more than this would be a spoiler. But although the cover itself and just when you see the plot, when you see what it is about, may be a little bit, may push you away from the movie. And me first, uh, when I was... When I watched the trailer and when I saw what it is about, I wasn't really uh, going to watch it because it, does, it didn't really sound relaxing to me. However, it turned out to be one of the best experiences, like one of the best movie experiences ever. So I do advise you and it is not scary as it seems and is not as hard as it seems. It does have certain moral message and... I believe it's going to be a valuable experience to you too. Second one of my list would be Lord of the Rings. So very classic thing. It's a film series of three fantasy adventure films and is directed by Peter Jackson. Uh, but it's based on a novel that was written by Tolkien, who I believe was a master of science fiction writing, fantasy writing. The films are called The Fellowship of the Ring, The Two Towers, and Return of the King. So in that order, The Fellowship of the Ring, uh, filmed in 2001, the first one. Second is The Two Towers, filmed in 2002. And then we have uh, The Return of the King, 2003. Each of the movies last about three, yeah, a little bit less or more than three hours. There we meet a hobbit from the land of Shire, the Hobbiton, and his eight companions. They set out to a special journey uh, where they aim to destroy a very powerful piece of jewelry, a uh, ring, one ring, and they aim to save their world from the dark power that is ruling it at the moment. Many people compare this one to the Harry Potter, but um, and categorize it as a movie for children. But for me, it was definitely not. Not only for me, but for a lot of people out there who review it as a masterpiece. Um, I think it's a win-win combination if you have maybe teens or um, if you want to watch it with your kids. But also, I think it's an evergreen thing and that everyone can make use of it. It does teach you many life lessons a lot of moral stories, a lot of ethical stories. So um, I think that you should give it a try no matter what age you are. Number three on the list, and however, uh, none of these movies, I didn't make this list uh, in my order of preference. So the first one uh, was not my, maybe my, the best one and vice versa. So I think it was just in the order they were lined <laughs> on my mind when I was making the list. But The Shawshank Redemption is definitely the favorite on IMBD uh, with the highest rate there. Um, it's nine point something, so 9.3 or four. I'm not exactly sure, but it's I know that it's the first one, the top one on IMBD review list. And there we have two imprisoned men uh, who bond over a number of years and they uh, here I'm quoting IMBD, they are fighting solace and eventual redemption through the acts of common decency. So I think this is, this, this describes it the best and I didn't want to paraphrase it. I think this quote was quite suitable. Uh, it's directed by Frank DeBorent and uh, it's also written uh, based on St Stephen King's short story, Rita Hayward and Shayshank Redemption. And the stars of the movie are Tim Robbins and Morgan Freeman. So it definitely has amazing cast. 
It's a prison drama from 1994, and the whole story、um, goes around the life, prison life of Andre Dufresne after he was sentenced for the murder of his wife and of her lover. Fun fact is that this movie did not make a huge amount of money and profit, but it's still listed as one of the best movies of all time on most of the review. Movie reviews、uh, lists, and it earned amazing critics and remained significant part of the pop culture. I did mention live lessons before, but I think this one is the best feature among the movies I have ever seen. So there is something special in this story, and there is something extremely powerful and beautiful for which I advise everyone to give it a shot. Next one on my list. Um, would be something that could be titled as and described as romance, or maybe even drama. Yeah, drama, romance, and biography in parts.、Um, it's called Eat, Pray, Love, and it's an American movie that was、uh, filmed in 2010 with Julia Roberts as the main character. This movie is based on、uh, the book with the same title. Uh, the m- memoir of Elizabeth Gilbert, in which she described herself leaving her husband and a couple of exotic trips around the world,、uh, where she was aiming to find herself. The main character, Liz Gilbert, had an amazing life that maybe every single woman around the world would imagine for herself. She had a handsome, she had a handsome husband. A big house, successful career, but she felt lost and she felt unsuccessful, unfulfilled. But she still, what made her different is that she still believes that it's not the end and that she can start over and find、uh, what makes her truly happy. And that's why he asks for a divorce and sets out on an amazing trip with three. Crucial destinations, and in each of the stops on her trip,、um, she purifies a certain area of her life. My number five would be Interstellar.、Um, it is made in 2014, and it is really epic science fiction film that was dire- directed and produced by Christopher Nolan. So this name itself tells you a lot.、Uh, but although I loved. Most of his movies, Interstellar, strikes to me as one of the most memorable. The story is set in dystopian future, and there we have our civilization and our planet struggling to survive. So basically, people are getting sick. They have lung problems from the extremely polluted air. Their crops cannot、uh, grow anymore. And that's why the scientists of the time predict that life on Earth is coming to an end, and sets an amazing crew to a trip to space to find the source of life somewhere else, and to try to save their children and to save their planet. One thing that was exciting for me and that was interesting is the purpose of time and the relativity of time that is shown in the movie. So. Uh, all the wonders. So imagine how difficult it was to create a movie that would have all the special effects and that would recreate the space, the trip to space, and all the wonders of physics and of the world of Earth. So definitely give it a try. Whether or not you're a fan of sci-fi, I think it still has a lot to offer. To anyone who is willing to give it a shot, the next one on my list would be *The Twelve Angry Men*, and it's filmed in 1957, and it's American court drama film. So everything happens in one room, and everything is based on the conversation between people. So there are no light effects, very few sound effects. There is no real action, but it's still. Is very successful in keeping your attention on point the whole time, and it's not even long. It's I think over one hour and a half, something like that. So the film, this film tells the story of jury of twelve men 
who are set to decide whether or not to deliberate uh, 18-year-old defendant. There are doubts, reasonable doubts, but uh, this case forces juries to really re-examine their morals and their values and beliefs. This is a story about conflict, story about values, story about opinions, and story about living your life up to your priorities. It is selected. Uh, it is selected to be the second best courtroom drama ever, uh, right after *To Kill a Mockingbird*. The next one on my list would be *Good Will Hunting*, uh, filmed in 1997, and it's American drama film uh, with Robin Williams, Matt Damon, and many others. It follows the story of the 20-year-old. Um, South Boston janitor, Will Hunting, and he is a genius that still did not, that still has not recognized himself and that still did not get recognized by the world. As Will starts seeing the therapist, uh, he has to reevaluate his relationships and has to face significant task of confronting his past and has to start thinking about the future. It also won two Oscars, Best Supporting Actor for Williams, and Best Original Screen Play. The next one on my list would be Beautiful Mind, uh, which was filmed in 2001, and it's American biographical drama film. It's based on the life of a renowned mathematician, John Nash, who received Nobel Prize in Economics, and his discoveries transformed the way economics works. I don't really want to spoil this one to you, but biographies and documentaries are uh, my favorite genres. And I think I've seen quite a lot of them, but this one, although I've seen it recently, did make certain impression on me. And it shows the difficult and troubling path one has to go through in order to succeed and in order to become the greatest. It has beautiful message, beautiful story, and it is really inspiring at times. But uh, other than that, it's quite educational and informational, informative. The next one on my list is Shutter Island, which is 2010 American psychological thriller. And it was starred Leonardo DiCaprio. This one has quite of a dark setting, but it also keeps your attention to the fullest and you also start to get into your own psychology at times. So it shows the unclear border between truth and between lie, between crazy and not crazy, and it shows the relativity of our moments and of our lifetime. So definitely one of the most unique things I've ever seen, and I advise you to give it a shot. And last but not least is Love, Rosie, my favorite romantic comedy drama. Don't get me wrong, I have nothing against romantic movies and romantic dramas, but I've seen quite a lot of them in my life, and most of them did have similar plot twists, similar stories, similar beginnings and endings, and Love, Rosie is one of those that is Um, quite different from the usual pattern. It talks about two friends, and they are friends, as long as they can remember, but uh, they start to fall in love with each other, and it's the story follows how their life evolves, and what love has to do with all of that, and what are the sacrifices that one must make for those that he loves. So I did list a little bit of everything for everyone, so I hope that you can find yourself in some of these stories and that you will give these a shot. Whether you like them or not, not, I really believe that you're not going to regret watching them because um, all of these are classics and really remain heavy in our pop culture. So for the sake of information only, it would be worth watching them, but I also believe you will find them enjoyable.
Thank you for being with us. Make sure to keep learning, keep growing, and we hope to see you in another week's episode. There are more interesting things yet to come. Bye-bye.